to uh, turn to the UK now, and uh, I'd like to introduce you to our partner, uh, Chris Towell. Uh, it's a, a much more reasonable hour there. I believe it's about 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, so uh, Chris is a, a partner uh, who splits his time between uh, Birmingham, where we have a substantial office in the sort of the manufacturing center of the UK, as well as uh, London, the financial center in the UK. Um, and I should also say that Chris spends a fair bit of time over here in North America, including uh, just last week. Chris is a corporate transaction lawyer uh, with deep experience in cross-border transactions, acquisitions, uh, private equity, and transactions involving uh, real estate. So, uh, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Scott. Um, same with Jamie, I hope, I hope everybody can hear me all right. Thanks for having me, nice to see you all. Um, unlike Jamie, I don't have a beard, or indeed, unlike Scott, I don't have a beard to distinguish me. So, um, to distinguish myself from all of the other handsome gentlemen on screen, I've, I've taken my tie off and I hope that makes it slightly easier for you. Um, as Scott said, I'm gonna try and give you a little bit of um, context, background to what's going on in the UK at the moment, what we think that means for ongoing trading opportunities, in particular, what we think that means in relation to opportunities for North American investment and trading into and via the UK. Um, context, I guess, so what's what's happened of note in the UK this year? Um, you, you would be forgiven for thinking probably the most interesting thing that's happened in the UK or relating to the UK this year is the royal visit to Canada and the little blue shorts that George was sporting each and every, every day of that. And, you know, that was probably more interesting in many ways. But the, the other big news, slightly overshadowed by slightly bigger news in, in the US recently at the same ilk, of course, was the shock, I say, referendum in the UK and the decision to leave the EU. Um, what does that mean for trading? I mean, from a, from a personal perspective, and in relation to our North American clients in particular, as you will understand, as you'll fully appreciate, that's the question that we're getting asked day after day, time and time again, although happily less and less as the months pass. Um, Brexit, what does it mean? In terms of the process, well, the short answer is we don't really know yet. Um, we don't really know who can trigger the Brexit process. There's a, there's a court case underway, well publicised at the moment, deciding whether or not the government can go ahead and do it, whether they need to have a conversation with Parliament, whether they might want to come back and talk to the individuals that voted one way or another. Again, seems unlikely, but possible. What are the government plans in relation to that process? We don't know. Theresa May has intimated that actually now she might give us an indication of what those are before she enters into negotiations, but again, you know, even the educated guesses vary quite significantly at the moment. Um, what's the timing in relation to Brexit? Well, we don't really know, I'm afraid. We, we all anticipate, as we are told, that the trigger, insofar as the government's allowed to exercise that trigger without other consent, will be pulled by March of next year, uh, which will push us into a two-year process of negotiations with the rest of Europe. But does that mean we'll have a decision? Does that mean we'll have exited within two years? Possibly, possibly not. It could be two years, it could be three, it could be seven, it could be eight. It just depends where we get to. What are the trading implications of that? Well, again, you know, with with fear and risk of sounding like I really haven't got a clue what's going on over here at the moment, um, we don't really know. You know, the discussions are, does it end up looking like something, you know, which is pretty much exactly the same to what we've got at the moment? Do we negotiate a new deal which allows us you know, freedom of movement, access to whatever we need access to, allows the rest of the Europeans access to our market in the same way they currently have, possibly. Um, do we enter into a number of separate trade deals which get us to a similar place, possibly. Do we enter into none of the above and just try to you know, trade freely and hope that everybody plays nicely? Well, that has been suggested, seems slightly less likely perhaps, but possibly again. Um, all of that added together sounds pretty unhelpful and pretty unsure. But actually, post the first month or so, the reality has been it's kind of business as usual. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare say, especially with my French and German colleagues on the line, that it's entirely business as usual and nothing has changed because, of course, a lot has changed and a lot will still have to change in the coming months and years. 
But the reality is actually for most of our clients, and in particular our North American clients, we can't just stop and wait for the next one, two, three, four, five year period to understand exactly what's happening before we continue with our daily lives and our daily businesses and our daily investments. So actually, what we're seeing in the markets at the moment is it, it kind of really is business as usual. So is the UK still the well-publicised gateway to Europe that it was previously? For now, hopefully. Will it continue to be in the future? Possibly not in the same way that it, that it always has been, but, but actually we would anticipate yes to a sensible degree. Um, what does it mean for UK trade and investment into the UK generally? Is it doomed? I, I don't think so. Is it growing in some sectors? Yes, very much so, actually. And again, is it is it business as usual? Well, kind of, kind of yes, kind of no. Um, I appreciate that's not in many ways particularly helpful. Having spent a week in the US myself last week with our lead European lawyer who, who lives and breathes Brexit and is very excited about it and talks about it non-stop, you might think I had a slightly better idea of what's going on. I, I, you know, I don't, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, it's an entertaining time to be a lawyer. It's an entertaining time to be in business. But it's not necessarily a negative or bad or worrying time to be any of those things, actually. And what we are finding is that investment into Europe and investment into the UK is pretty much back to where it was pre the Brexit vote and in some areas is actually increasing and encouraging. And against that, I would without wanting to end my first context introductory slide in even more doom and gloom, um, just, I guess, mention that against the backdrop of exit, Brexit is a wider backdrop of global uncertainty in relation to you know, markets generally. So in the US, slightly shock election. You know, Germany, France have got elections coming up. Obviously, things are going on in Italy, which 12 months, two years ago, probably wouldn't have been expected. Austria is having, having similar discussions. So. This isn't a UK phenomenon, this is a worldwide phenomenon. And it's something which possibly, if everybody stops, stands still and does nothing, has the ability, of course, to get into the way of what you do in your daily lives and your business and your, your plans for investment and expansion. But at the moment, I think we say doesn't necessarily need to. And from what we're seeing, most of our clients are accepting that it doesn't really need to and moving on. So opportunities. Are there any? Um, well, we would say absolutely yes. And you know, from what we're seeing in the various markets, all of our clients seem to be saying absolutely yes. You know, should we should we worry about the UK market going away? Should we all be focusing on other parts of Europe? Well, not just yet, we would say. However, again, mindful of the fact that I've got French and, and German colleagues on the line, absolutely, if that's what you want to do, then they're you know fantastic. They would be very happy to advise you. And between us, I'm sure we can we can work out whatever the answer might be. Um, from a UK selfish personal perspective, the fact of the matter is that the UK continues to be one of Canada's top trading partners. It continues to be one of America's top trading partners. It continues to be seen as one of the lead destinations for investment from North America. And indeed, that's investment into the UK and that's investment into Europe via the UK. It's, it's still ranked as the lead destination in Europe for doing business. Um, and that's in terms of ease of doing business, employment regulations, obtaining finance, business focused tax. Um, key sectors, key sectors are alive and doing actually really rather well at the moment. So real estate investment, for example, is a huge sector in the UK. We had a quiet summer, as you would expect, post Brexit, people were waiting to see what would happen with pricing. The reality is the pound is slightly depressed, which means investment opportunities, if you are a North American investor, are actually better than they were a year ago. Everything's 15% cheaper than it was a year ago. And actually what we're seeing from our North American clients is that having had a period of two, three, four months where people quietened down a little bit to wait and see what was happening, um, actually now they're returning with vigor. The same is true with the tech market, the life sciences market, the investment markets generally, albeit that they probably suffered slightly less of an immediate <coughs> post-Brexit hangover. So. I guess one of the messages there, one, you know, the pound is lower than it has been for some time. So if you're looking to invest in an overseas market and the UK is on your list, now's not a bad time if you want to get bang for your buck. Um, are there things that you should be worried about in relation to the UK and Europe? Well, of course there is uncertainty, but at the moment I don't think it's uncertainty that should be leading decisions or blocking decisions. Um, I don't think our colleagues 
elsewhere would disagree with that necessarily. Um, I don't think it's likely that the UK is going to cease to be a lead trading partner with North America, be that Canada, be that you know, um, Central America or elsewhere. So I would say just you know, keep coming. It's a great place. Why, why would you not want to be here? Um, the, the slightly more boring bits, which I've promised I'll, I'll cover, the legal considerations. So, I mean, I've got a fairly easy job here, actually, I think, without worrying too much about the background context and what may or may not be going on in the wider world. The fact of the matter is, the UK is and continues to be recognised as a safe and reliable and quite easy place to do business. So, you know, the, the harsh reality is, whether we or other people like it or not, it is one of the overseas destinations for North American investment, which is closest to what you would recognise as being normal back home. So our, you know, the way that we do business, the way that we do M&A, the way that we deal with contracts is, is more similar to the North American way than other parts of Europe and the wider world. I don't think that's going to change. Um, the UK tends to have a, well, well I, I use the word sensible um, advisedly, not suggesting that anybody else is less sensible, but a sensible and straightforward approach to contracts. So essentially, you know, in the UK, you can kind of agree whatever you want to agree, so long as everybody's on board with that and within sensible limits. So if you want to acquire a company in a particular way, if you want to set up and do business in a particular way and agree arrangements with third parties in a particular way, most of the time you can, so long as the relevant people are on board. Of course, there's frameworks within we need to within which we need to act, but actually slightly less prescriptive than in other destinations. Um, we have, I think, you know, I don't think this is untoward suggesting this, but we have a, a very well established and very well respected legal system. Enforcement in the UK is not typically an issue, and enforcement of UK judgments elsewhere is not typically an issue. So you will see in a number of agreements, for example, which are not UK based agreements or UK based businesses even, UK law is still imported as the law of choice. That's not going to change anytime soon, we would say. The World Bank still says, even right now, that the UK is the best place to do business in Europe, the easiest place to do business in Europe, uh, for a number of reasons. We still have, apparently, the most business-focused courts. Uh, tax system is, is coming online, is increasingly competitive. Finance is readily available and is very business-focused and very business-friendly. So the message there is, you know, we're just here to be your friends. We're not here to kind of try to stop you doing business or unnecessarily put roadblocks in the way that would prevent you doing what you want or need to do. When it comes to acquiring or setting up a business in the UK, um, again, you know, it's a, it's a relatively straightforward process. It's similar to the North American process. It's, it's arguably slightly less aggressive if we're talking about M&A, so slightly less buyer-friendly, for example. Um, but it is a lot closer to the, the North American way of life than many other countries in, in, in Europe and beyond. Um, what are the key legal considerations? Well, I'll, I'll touch on each of these briefly, um, even more briefly than Jamie did, because frankly there are less issues, I would say, for you to be worried about if you're doing business in the United Kingdom, because in each of these areas, without suggesting that China's a scary place to do business, for example, um, the United Kingdom is not a particularly scary place to do business. So intellectual property, which, which will be key to, you know, and, and critical to most businesses, it's still key and it's still critical in the United Kingdom, but unlike in certain other jurisdictions, you don't have the backdrop of being terrified that actually somebody else is going to be able to take your intellectual property and stop you getting it back. So we have a, a, you know, a normal, well-recognised, sophisticated and respected regime it's not expected that that will change. You know, certain parts of it might change as and when the UK leaves Europe, but if they do change, they will probably keep step with whatever the rest of the world, the sensible and you know fair, we say, parts of the world are doing. Um, you know, from a from a firm perspective, we, I mean, as 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 our Canadian colleagues will tell you, have a you know a, a ridiculously strong worldwide you know world beating IP practice. So there aren't many issues across the globe from an IP perspective that we can't look at and deal with for you and protect you against. Data protection, obviously key and critical, especially in relation to North American businesses who are doing business elsewhere and you know, even more so for the US than Canada, but terrified that their 
secret slash sensitive information might be stolen or misused? Well, the reality is in the UK, the regime, again, is pretty much as thorough and sophisticated as you're going to find. The, the current Data Protection Directive, um, which of course is a European directive, is in force in the UK. The new General Data Protection Regulations, which are coming into force soon, will be in force in the UK. And that won't change unless and until the UK leaves Europe. And even if the UK does leave Europe, or probably I should say when the UK leaves Europe, I should probably just accept reality. Um, even if we decide to adopt something which is slightly different to that, the reality is because of the views of the rest of the world, data protection isn't going to go, it's going to go away. It's not something the UK is going to stop protecting. So ultimately, we will inevitably negotiate some form of privacy shield, which will be very similar slash the same as the regulations. So data protection, we would say, not something that you need to be concerned about. You know, absolutely, it's a key point, but it's something that we are as alive to as you will be. Employment issues, well, again, without wanting to point the finger elsewhere, actually, employment issues in the UK, they're not particularly scary. You know, we don't have perhaps quite the same ability as you might have in North America to deal with employees in exactly the way we might like at any given time. But it is a sensible, straightforward, contractual approach with basic minimum rights enshrined in, in employment law. So essentially, unlike China and the, the picture that Jamie was just painting, if you have got a seriously underperforming employee, you can deal with that. You know, if you've got an issue, you can probably deal with it. To the extent that there's an issue which cannot be immediately dealt with under the contract, we can probably deal with it anyway and mitigate whatever risk might flow from that. So, you know, employment law, whilst it is a scary topic in many countries and some of my colleagues, I have no doubt, will touch upon that in relation to their jurisdiction shortly. In the UK, it's not really something that you need to get too uptight about. Work councils here are very, very rare. That's not necessarily the case across other parts of Europe, but here it's not that big a problem. Um, tax, I will touch upon very briefly. And again, really only to say that the UK tax regime, you know, love it or hate it, it's sensible, it's middle ground, it's becoming even more business focused, um, it's becoming increasingly competitive. So whilst we are not a tax haven, we are not a destination which incoming businesses fear in relation to the tax implications. Where does that leave us? Um, I mean, I think we would say, and, and this is what we're seeing in relation to our clients and, and the business they're doing, there continues to be just as much opportunity in the United Kingdom as there has ever been. And, you know, I can't gaze into a crystal ball and tell you that that will continue forever and ever more, and that whatever happens in the rest of the world, you know, the rest of Europe, the UK leaving the European Union will not necessarily affect that, or there might not be the odd bump in the road. Um, I think what I can tell you is that we're confident that there won't be any major problems, and even as things change, solutions will be found to enable the UK to trade with the rest of the world in the way that it has always enjoyed doing, and and vice versa. And from a from a firm perspective, what I would say is, you know, genuinely, to the extent that the UK is the right destination of choice for you, fantastic, we'd love to help. To the extent that, for whatever reason, you feel that you know France or Germany or other areas of the of the, of the world are the right place for you, then. Equally, we'd love to help. You know, it, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution, but we do have a solution in most of those jurisdictions. So, to the extent that you want assistance in the UK, you know, all day long, please let us know. But to the extent that you, for reasons which, of course, I would not be able to fathom, decide that you know France or Germany is a better choice, then you know, we have the people here that can help. Thank you. No, well, no, thank you, Chris. That's uh, terrific.